What is the power of objective observation? Oh, this is my favorite thing. We could, we could heal the whole planet just on objective observation. It's rare, but it's the most important thing for an artist, I think, of all the tools in the toolkit, objective observation. I think actors do it, um, I was going to say painters do that uh, all the time. They're always looking, and when they look and they observe objectively, not with judgment, they don't look at a tree and say, oh, tree, not nice on the left, good on the right, not so good on the left. Painters look at things to see what they haven't seen before. Objective observation is the art of just looking, just looking, no judgment. So if I say to you, just look, just spend 10 minutes looking, without judgment. Can you see that is a rare, rare thing? We don't do that. And one of the reasons we don't slow down enough, you have to slow down. You have to still yourself. So it's another way to get into a meditative state. But for an artist, when you look objectively without judgment, you can discover what you haven't seen before. So most of us look and see and go, I know that. I got it. Check. You know, that's it. There's no more learning. There's no more discovery. But if you walk by in New York, I have this tree outside the apartment that I'm very fond of and that I look at daily when I'm in New York. And I, I, I will just spend time looking at this tree objectively. Thoughts did drift away, emotions, worry, everything just away. I just look at the tree, I look at the spaces between the leaves, I look at the leaves. And, you know, this is me, but I swear, you do that and a breeze will come up and the tree will go like this and wave at you. You'll see, you know, a bird make a nest at the top. All of these things are happening around you and available to you all of the time. But you have to still yourself and look and you have to be aware of how much judgment you have because we're trained to it. You know, we're all walking around with so much judgment. You know, and, and social media isn't helping us. I like it. I don't like it. Uh, the things that people say to people on social media are just, I, it, I, it's unfathomable to me. Um, so those people are a little asleep, and we, we have, you set an example, and then something else becomes cool. We have, to try. <laughs> we have to try to make awakening hip. We have to try to make awakening consciousness cool. And there, you know, there are lots of people waking up at the same time. So we'll, we'll find a way to, to make people you know, want to do that more. But objective observation is the artist's greatest tool because it allows them to see what they think they know and discover what they didn't see before. And when you work with someone, how can you tell that maybe they haven't awoken that part yet? That, that they don't have it in them at this point? Well, they, well, it's because it starts with the first exercise, the environment exercise, where they create a space. Because the exercises go in your life, study your life's rhythms, Study how you make coffee. Study how you make breakfast. Study how you shave. Study, you know, all these different life. The guy who studied how he got dressed for work uh, in his police job. These are all life rhythms that, that we do them over and over and over again. And when we look at those objectively and discover the behavior we didn't see before and then duplicate that behavior, so then they come to the exercise and there's not enough behavior, I can tell that they haven't been looking for it. So then I have them go back and make a list and bring me the list. What are the behaviors? I mean, here's a perfect example. My, my husband was shaving one morning and you know we worked together and and when the studio was open he was there all the time as well and so he's shaving in the morning and he starts to observe objectively his shaving exactly how he shaves and the habits and the, you know we do all these little things and then he finished shaving and then he went to put his contact lenses in he does these things exactly the same every morning he goes to put his contact lenses and he puts a contact lens in and he goes like this 
And he said he went and he looked at a painting that my father did of me across the room, and he looked at it with his eye. That's how he checked to see if the contact was seated right. Then he put the other one in, and he looked at the painting with that eye, and he realized he had been doing this for 12 years, 15, and he had never realized that he did this checking with the eyes. <clears throat> if you put that behavior into a movie, I'm telling you, people will love it because it's human behavior and everybody knows it. And it was discovered. He looked at what he does every day, what he knows how to do, and he discovered something he'd never seen before. That's art. That's art. Discovery is art. You know, I, I looked for a definition because I'm a teacher of art. I wanted a definition of art that would inspire, that would light people up. I couldn't find it. And I looked in a lot of dictionaries. And, you know, they talk about creativity and they talk about all kinds of things. But I, nothing rang my bell. So I finally asked myself, you know, what do I think this is? What is this? And it came very clear to me, you know, that art is the expression of that which you've discovered. If, you, if there's no discovery, there's no art. It's going to be just, uh, you know, a rendition of something that you've seen before, that you liked, you know, and you make a little rendition of that and feels like it's good. But if you discover something, now you have something personal to give, even if it's as small as putting your contacts in and checking in to see if they're seated right in the picture. Then you'd have the shot of the painting, which is pretty dramatic, and then you have the shot of it. I don't know where you go from there, but it's a beautiful piece of behavior, and the story is told in behavior. So when you say the word rendition, if we go back to asking an actor, what do you want? What do you want from life? Oh, well, I want to be famous. I want to be in this movie. I want to do the next Blue Jasmine. I want, And then you go, wait a minute. Do you really want to do that, or is that a rendition? Of what you've that that's is is there something that's more authentic to you? Yeah, I think that's true. I don't want to be hard on them if they love blue velvet and they love you know there all kinds of things add up in them to an excitement of wanting to be a filmmaker. I want to make films like that, but if you just direct them to this place to ask questions, if you direct them to these tools like objective observation keeping your vibration high with gratitude and, you know, what should have so many blessings. Anybody making a film has a lot of blessings, you know. Uh, joy list, uh, I think there are several others, but objective observation is one of them. You give them these tools and they will begin to listen to themselves. You know, the entire book, the, my entire purpose of writing a book and I don't call it my book because, you know, a lot of it just came through. Um, I call it the book. But the sole purpose of it was, can I use this technique and these lessons that I've learned in my life to help someone listen to the muse in them, listen to their own soul speaking, listen to that, uh, find that place of inspiration where all of these, the same things come from that one space which is, you know, the, in meditation they call it the gap. It's a place without thought. And the longer you, for me, the longer I work with it, the more it creates this kind of a space. And it feels like peace. It feels like relaxation. But if you ask questions, like, why do I like blue velvet? Or, you know, why do I want... You know, things will come in, and those things that come in will move in you, and then you'll know, oh, that's, that's what I want to do. That's, that's the muse. That's speaking to me. That's my, that's my purpose. That's my goal. That's, that's authentic. That's a discovery. You discover. You have an aha moment. You ask yourself, and then you go, oh, that's, that's charged. That's gold. That's what you're looking for. So the whole purpose was to lead people to that space to question and uh, listen for the right answers and then teach them, this one's loaded. Go for that one. Go after that. So it's the gap. The gap is the space. And when you're in the gap, which is really the present moment, you know, 
when you watch an actor who's, you know, all the time, all the time, people say, you know, you know, actors say, I want to live in the moment. You know, this is the whole movement in acting about being in the moment. Is he in the moment? Is he going to be in the moment? And so people think being in the moment is improvisational. Being in the moment is not just improvisational. That's part of it, to be in the moment improvisationally. Okay, that's part of it. But the moments are created by you in your imagination from this story that you want to tell underneath the story. So here's the script. And here's, you know, your choices. The script is um, the tip of the iceberg, and the actor's work is the whole bottom of the iceberg. So you're going to create a story underneath that screenplay that brings that screenplay to life. Those choices, the more authentic, the more aha, the more they're made from that space through questions that you ask yourself over and over until you go, oh, what if it was that? And you put that into the work in a concrete way. Now you're cooking with gas. Now you're really creating. So there's no worry about, you know, he likes this or I had to worry about is he being authentic? Is he not being authentic? Just lead them to that space. Let them practice in that space. Let them learn how to observe objectively. Let them discover by observing, you know, let them discover by observing objectively. And then let them take that discovery and put it into the work in a concrete way. Because it's not enough for it to be in your head. People think, oh, I've got this thing, I have this idea, I think it's so great. Well, if that idea doesn't go into some form of behavior, some form of physical choice in the scene, it, it's all for naught. It doesn't exist. Actors write long biographies. I don't need long biographies. I need a biography that has enough things that activate certain behavioral choices in the scene. Have you seen the most aha in a performance in film or theater? That's a good question. You know, what comes to mind, the first thing that comes to mind, I can't believe this comes to mind, it was so long time ago. I saw Alec Guinness uh, in Dylan on Broadway. Oh my God. So at the end of this play, you know, Dylan Tom, about Dylan Thomas, he builds, you know, he's been told, if you have another drink, you're going to die. You cannot drink, you're going to die. So he goes into the White Horse Tavern, and he builds, he orders, I don't know, 40 shot glasses, and he builds a tower of these shot glasses. He builds, very carefully builds them one on top of another, on top of another, on top of another. And then, at the very last moment of the play, he takes the top one off, and he shoots the thing, and there's a blackout, right? I didn't realize I had watched him build that tower with no words, just full on inner life. I don't know, 15 minutes, 10 minutes? That's a very brave thing to do in a play. And I had entered it. I was he, you know, we enter the character. We don't just go into the white horse tavern. We enter the character, we experience what he's experiencing which helps us, you know, to realize the genius of actors. If we can enter his experience, we can certainly enter that for our fellow man. If we started entering each other's experiences a little bit more and caring a little bit more, that, that's why I think acting reverberates with people so much, why we love artists and we love performance, but I don't think we're aware that that's why.